Hi everybody, welcome to another pre-recorded lecture and today I'm going to completely switch gears so we are done with uh, the knowledge of periodicity we are not done with cluster algebras but we're going to, uh, yeah, generally the last couple weeks are going to be unrelated to what I'm going to talk for the rest few weeks which is going to be about Grassmannians so the subject is Grassmannian cluster algebras and it's an important example of cluster algebras like a major example it's in the book and I think it's in the first in, in the first few chapters but I intentionally kind of skipped it well I only talked about the triangulation thing so in general the Grassmannian cluster algebras are going to be a generalization of triangulations cluster algebras okay so what is the Grassmannian let me remind you by the way this is another lecture where people some people are gonna have a lot of background so it's it's good that you can skip ahead and I can go slowly for those who don't know about this a lot so the Grassmannian uh, is the space <coughs> the space of uh, k-dimensional linear subspaces of c to the n and as we discussed previously you can also think about if you like if you choose a basis then it's going to be k row vectors of length n so uh, in other words you can also write the Grassmannian as, and that's mostly what we're going to do is as the set of matrices m is a k by n matrix of full rank, so rank is equal to k, modular <coughs> row operations. Row operations correspond to choosing a different basis of your linear subspace. And in particular, like generically, you can, if you have a k by n matrix, if you have a k by n matrix like this, you can always sort of well, not always, but if you're lucky, you can put it in this, you can just kind of apply raw operations uniquely that you get the identity matrix in the first k columns. And, the, and n minus k entries are going to just be free. And therefore, the dimension, this is an open dense subset of the Grassmannian. So the dimension of the whole Grassmannian, and as well as of this subset, it's called the Schubert cell is equal to k times n minus k and previously we discussed about a nice set of coordinates on, on the Grassmannian which are called Plucker coordinates which are denoted p sub j where j is j is a k element sub it's a set of k columns basically right, so these are just the maximal minors of your matrix m and so they are the j's are defined defined up to a common scalar <coughs> right because you can when you apply row operations, you can rescale some rows by numbers, and that, that's going to rescale all of these maximal minors by the same number. And also, they uh, they determine 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 the row span of M. So, in other words, they de determine the subspace V. Right? If you know all these Plucker coordinates, you can, well, actually, if, if your matrix is in this form and you know all Plucker coordinates, then you can kind of express every entry as a ratio of two, of two maximal minors. And that's how you kind of reconstruct this matrix in row echelon form, basically. Anyways, the point is that these are coordinates. They are not algeb algebraically independent. And they are algebraically dependent as you remember there is a relation like p13 times or more generally let me write p 
S A S A C S A C times P S B G is equal to P S A B P S C D plus P S A G times P S B C. And that's going to be an important Flicker relation for us. And in general, there is a set of Flicker relations such that if you give me a point, if you give me a collection of these cor Flicker coordinates, then if it satisfies all of these algebraic relations, then it it comes from some matrix, from some matrix of rank K. Okay, so now let me, uh, some of you have already seen my class on total positivity from last year. Uh, today I'm gonna try to kind of motivate, well, yeah, today I'm gonna discuss the totally non-negative Grossmannian, which some of you are already familiar with. Which, by the way, uh, at some point before I was uh, was explaining the motivations for cluster algebras, and I said there was two main reasons. One was like canonical basis, and another one was the epistemological periodicity, periodicity stuff, and that's true. But there is one, there was one more major reason, which was this theory of total positivity, which is, I mean, it, it comes also from this canonical basis, but it it's, it was a separate kind of motivation for Fermin and Zelensky and they actually wrote a lot of papers on, on this theory of total positivity but since I taught a class last year I, I was trying to separate them but you can't really separate them completely they, they go hand in hand so that's why today I want to discuss this totally non-negative Grossmannian so what is the definition? the definition of the totally non-negative Grossmannian is very simple it's the totally non-negative Grossmannian k comma n is the the set of all it's the subset of the Grossmannian where all Flicker coordinates are non-negative for all j just you take row spans of all matrices whose all maximal minors have the same sign so it's important these even though the Plicker coordinates are defined up to rescaling by a common scalar, so in general they are kind of a bunch of complex numbers. Uh, so, so this is only the definition only makes sense after rescaling all of them by a non-zero common scalar. So, okay, so you give me a complex k-dimensional subspace, I measure all these Plicker coordinates and then I check whether their ratios are, like whenever two of them are non-zero, the ratio is positive, real number. That's, that's what this definition is actually saying. And yeah, there's also the, there's also the, what is called the totally positive Grossmannian, it's the subset of the, well, it's, it's an open subset where all these Plicker coordinates are actually strictly positive. For all j in bracket n choose k. Yeah. And so, okay, so I'm going to discuss these two spaces for a while. So far, it's completely a kind of algebraic problem. But as we discussed in the last lecture, even though you start with some algebra, but then somehow it naturally gives you nice combinatorics. And the combinatorics, is, in my personal opinion, is going to be very nice in this case. So, okay, so here is the first question. Here is the first question that you may be wondering about questions. Is, well, so far, what I what I have given you is a an, an overdetermined system of inequalities. So, does it have a solution? Is is each of these spaces uh, 
empty or non empty. If you don't know the answer, I encourage you to pause and think for a while. Just try to come up with examples. Okay, yeah, so the actual examples are okay, so for, for this, for the total and negative gross margin, it's pretty easy. Right? You can just you can just take the row span of the matrix on well you just you just take a matrix which has the identity matrix on the left and then zero on the right. And then, then all of these Plucker coordinates are well Pluck all of these Plucker there's one maximum minor that's equal to one and the rest are zero. So they're all non negative. So that's easy. But uh, for this guy, it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's well, w one, uh, one example that you may already be familiar with is you can take the Vandermond Vandermond matrix. Yeah, all right, you can you can choose you can choose. Uh, some positive numbers, x1, x2, etc., up to xn. And then you can write, write, them, write them in a matrix of the form. One, 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 one. Uh, wait, sorry, no, it's supposed to be x, x sub k. x1, x2, all the way up to x sub k. x1 squared, x2 squared etc x sub k squared etc f x sub x x1 to the n minus 1 etc x sub k to the n minus 1 okay and now why is it is it true that this matrix is totally positive you can choose well if you choose the first k columns then the minor is not zero that's just the van der Maan determinant but if you choose some other set of columns, it's going to be tricky. Right? It's 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 not clear whether that's going to be positive. But it, it turns out it's going to be positive, and this is related to sure polynomials and things like that. So uh, so this matrix uh, belongs to the totally positive Grossmannian. But this is tricky to show. But it's true. So at least these spaces are not empty. That's good. By the way, I'm gonna uh, when I I'm not gonna say totally positive and totally non negative all the time. So I'm gonna abbreviate TP as totally positive. And TNN as totally non-negative. Cool. So, uh, yep. Uh, I guess the next question is, if they are non-empty, how do they look like? How do you maybe? So, so what I have written down here is how to parameterize how to parameterize, uh, well, let's say the totally positive Grossmannian. You know, is how does it look like, or something like this. And we're going to answer this, yeah. So it, it turns out that this, this space is basically, uh, this space is an open ball, basically. That's, uh, of dimension k times n minus k. So there is there is a nice parameterization using certain combinatorial objects that we're going to discuss. And the well, but this totally positive Grassmannian is a kind of an open subset of the totally non-negative Grassmannian. And actually, the totally non-negative Grassmannian is subdivided into cells. So uh, let's say you. Okay, so that was that was the first question. The second question is how to how do you parameterize these things? 
And the third question is, uh, if, I, if I give you a matrix inside the TNN gross minor, so some of the political coordinates are gonna be positive, strictly positive, and some are gonna be zero. The question is which uh, the J's can be zero. Well, it's, it's a weird, yeah, which collections of maximal minors can be zero and which are strictly positive. So the point is that if I give you a matrix, you can't re really choose any set of political coordinates to be zero and the rest to be strictly positive. It, that may turn out to be an empty subset. For example, for example, uh, let's say I consider the Fluker relation. Yeah, let me even just have uh, let me even just have P one three, P two four equal to P one two, P three four plus P one four, P two three. Right, that's a relation for a two by four matrix. Say one one zero zero, A B C D, something like this. So, and let's say I know that all of these are non-negative. Then what happens is that if P12, P34, P14, P23 are strictly positive, then, so then the right-hand side is strictly positive. But the left-hand side is zero. Well, but the left-hand side cannot be zero then, right? because of this relation. Then P13 times P24 has to be strictly positive. So in particular, so you can't have, can't have like P13 is e equal to zero. And, uh, and, these, and these four, So the, the cell with like with these conditions is already empty. So you have to be careful when you choose which inequalities are strict strict and which are zero. Yeah. And by the way, uh, without the positivity, like if you if you just ask for zero for which things can be zero and which things can be non-zero, then this reasoning no longer applies. For example, if I take a matrix which looks like one, 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 zero, 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 and then uh, and what do I have? Then I can even, wait, wait can I? Yeah, anyways, the point is that for this matrix, uh, all of these guys, They are not quite positive, but they are at least non-zero. You can, I think you can, you should be able to make them positive, no? No. Well, um, okay. Should I, should I add one more? Yeah, anyway, never mind. The, all these things are non-zero. Not zero, but P13 and P24 is equal to zero. So that's that somehow happens outside of the t of total positivity. But when I restrict to to, to things being positive, then then this can't happen really. Okay. And so you can kind of you want to classify. You basically you want you have this totally non-negative Grassmannian. It is subdivided into cells. Inside every inside each cell, you fix which political coordinates are strictly positive and which are zero. So the question is like, can you classify all these cells? Can you enumerate them and etc. Okay, and all these questions have nice answers. Which, by the way, if you're while you listen to this, please feel free to kind of try to see where where it does cluster algebra combinatorics come in. Like what are gonna be the seeds 
what's the quiver, what are the seeds, and what are the mutations. So far, hopefully it's unclear, at some point uh, you may or may not have a guess. Okay. Now, let me start by kind of trying to answer the first two questions first. How, how do you show that they are non-empty and how do you parameterize these spaces? And the answer is, well, I'm not gonna, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna tell you what is the corresponding combinatorial object. And the corresponding combinatorial object is called a playbook, well, so a playbook, playbook graph. Playbook means uh, planar, planar by colored graph is a well we're only going to deal with bipart with planar bipartite graphs more generally you can consider bicolored but for us it's going to be just bipartite is a bipartite graph embedded in a disk Mm. And then there is an extra condition which, uh, which is going to be used for this gross mining with n boundary vertices uh, with n boundary black vertices of degree one n black boundary vertices of degree one so the vert these and vertices are on the boundary of the disk let me try to uh, draw a picture so here is my disk and then i choose let's say n boundary and black boundary vertices each of degree one and then i can uh, i can connect them to well maybe something like this So this is a playbook, playbook graph. And I'm always going to denote these boundary vertices by B1, B2, up to all the way up to Bn in clockwise order. Yeah. So that's the that's the combinatorial objects which are going to be important. So yeah, this is if you, if you want to think about the quivers, then the quiver is hidden somewhere in this picture. Now, uh, okay, it's bipartite, and let me also, in order to parameterize these totally non-negative and only positive spaces, I'm also going to consider the mm, considered weighted bipartite graphs. So weighted playbook, playbook graph is just well, you just kind of, you just assign positive real edge weights to all, to all edges. So you assign positive real edge weights. So just choose some numbers. Mm -hmm. Let's say one, square root of two, some kind of a, b, a, b, c, d, yeah, you just any, uh, g, this could be like pi or something like this, g of h, i, j, something like this. That's your, uh, that's your edge weights. And so you, you get weighted playbook graphs. And okay, so how do I, so far it's just some kind of basic high school level combinatorics, but what do I do with this? Uh, with this playbook graph? And the answer is that I need to consider d the dimer model, what it's called. So I want to consider the matchings of this graph. And well, the problem with this graph in particular is that it has it has way too many black vertices. So I want to consider matchings, perfect matchings. It, each perfect matching is gonna is gonna uh, connect, is gonna involve a black vertex and a white vertex. But the problem is that if I assign, if I, the problem is that your graph may, it has too many black vertices usually. 
because all the boundary vertices are black, so uh, usually you end up leaving out a few of them. So instead of a perfect matching, I'm gonna introduce the notion of an almost perfect matching. An almost perfect matching. is a matching using so it has to use all interior vertices and only some boundary vertices yeah let me uh, yeah i should have a letter let's say the Pretty A is going to be my letter for almost perfect matchings. So, in particular, let's say I have, okay, let's say I even try with the weighted one. So, my almost perfect matching has to use all interior vertices. Let's see. So, maybe I Maybe I do something like this. Mm. Yeah. That's an almost perfect matching. I have on the only vertices which are left out are black boundary vertices. All each interior vertex, vertex participates in a matching in, in an edge of my matching and okay so now given a uh, given almost perfect matching i want to define the boundary of a so the boundary is the so it's a subset it's a subset of n of bracket n right uh, it's just the set of used bound boundary vertices So in this case, the boundary of A is equal to the set 1, 3, because I have used vertices B1 and B3. And also let me say that the weight of A is just the product of weights of the edges. Right, so I'm going to denote I'm going to denote a weighted plated graph. It's going to be denoted is just a pair g comma weight, where weight is yeah. So weight uh, is the function on the which assigns assigns positive real numbers to the edges of my graph, just as we did over here, and then for each matching, I just take the product of edge weights. So nothing really deep going on here. But then you can, and you can still kind of not clearly see, like what is even, is this supposed to be related to Grassmannian? Okay, I can see n boundary vertices. But what is k? Grassmannian has two parameters, k and n. Here I only have n so far. Or do I, right? Because actually, if you if you look, what is what is k here? K is the number of black boundary vertices that are used, and so it's easy to see. Claim uh, the size of the size of the mm, of the boundary of any perfect matching. Uh, does not depend on the almost perfect matching. So it only depends on your graph G, on your platic graph. And the proof, the reason why this is true is, well, you, you know, every, all the boundary vertices are black. Right? And every matching, every edge of your matching, you take matches a white vertex to a black vertex so k is just uh, well i guess the number of vertices left 
is somehow n minus k is the number of black vertices minus the number of white vertices. Something like this should be true. Because yeah, so every matching has to use one white and white one black vertex, and all the white vertices are going to be used. So the number of black vertices which are left is going to be fixed. Okay, so now we have we have and k is going to denote, always denote this the size of any of the boundary of any almost perfect matching. So now you can ask, well, all right, what what is the relation to the Grassmannian? And the answer is that. Uh, so I guess I should I should I should denote, let's say, uh, so the definition, let's say p sub so for um, g comma weight, it's a weighted by weighted Playbook graph. Playbook graph, and then uh, I also choose. So j is a k element subset of bracket n then i'm going to define p sub j of g comma weight is just by definition the sum over all almost perfect matchings of g such that uh, their boundary so their boundary is equal to j so i take the sum over all such matchings and I, what i sum up is their weights And the weight is the product of, of the edges that I used. Okay, and so claim that, that I want to. Now here comes the relation to the to the totally non-negative grass minion. Okay, so let me denote first of all. Denote, denote. I'm gonna I'm gonna write mass. Bound, th this is the boundary measurement map. So you give me a, a weighted plated graph, and it's just by definition the collection of this p sub j of g comma weight, where j runs over all possible sets of boundary vertices. So the theorem is that uh, the theorem is that uh, for any Weighted playbook graph G G comma weight. I guess I have to I have to also say uh, so such that G admits an almost perfect matching. So otherwise, all of these coordinates are going to be zero. So I don't want that to happen. Such that J admits an almost perfect matching, at least one. Uh, what what happens is that there is boundary measurement map. Uh, it, it is the collection of Kluger coordinates of some element v inside the totally non-negative Grassmannian k comma n and in fact this is sort of an if and only if in fact any point in the totally non-negative Grassmannian k comma n arises this way so that's the that's the relation let me try to give you an example i'm not going to prove the theorem even though uh, i guess i could have in a few lectures but let me instead instead give you an example so let's say i i consider a playbook graph with four boundary vertices and then let's say my edges look like this and let's say my edge weights are i don't know a what should i 
Okay, let me, whatever. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Whatever. Then, uh, so that's, that is G comma weight. And now I want to compute what is, what are the boundary measurements of G comma weight. And okay, I have to compute yeah, let me even, let, let me send some of them to one, because otherwise it's going to be too much. Mm, yeah, let's say, just randomly. Hopefully you, you don't think I'm cheating right now. Yeah, these are all just ones. Yeah, let me do one more. One, yeah, something like this. Okay, now I have to compute all, all of the almost perfect matchings of this graph. I think there is going to be maybe six of them. So what are the almost perfect matchings? Well, first of all, I can choose, you know, let me just try to draw all of them. Okay, that's one. Let me, let me also label the boundary vertices. Etc. One, two, three, four. So the boundary here is uh, the boundary of A is one, two. Let's say I do something else. Mm. Yeah, maybe let's say I do this and this and this. Right, so the boundary of A is one, three. Okay, now I can do try one, four. Boundary is one four. You can see that all, all these boundary sets are of the same size. Um, okay, I think maybe I can try two four. Wait, wait, no, I should also try two three first. If I do two three, uh, then wait, no, that's not good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I get something like this. The boundary is two three, and finally I can have. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Finally, if I if my boundary is two, four, then then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have two possible matchings. One that looks like this, and one that looks like this. Right. So in in either case, the boundary is two, four. And the boundary is two, four. All right. So now, if I compute, if I compute all these Plucker coordinates, p one two is equal to just. So I'm looking at this picture, and I only have a times e. A times e. And then p uh, one three is equal to a times f times c. P one four is equal to a times j times c. P two three is equal to f. P one two two three. P three. What is p three four? Wait, where is three four? Is there one more? One, two, three, four. If I want to find P three four, no. Okay. Okay. P three four is P three four is equal to uh, F C H J. Okay. And finally, P two four is equal to and the sum of these two things. Right, so on the left I have uh, is it just J? On the right I have uh, H E 
J. All right. So I have these. I have these blue coordinates. Now I want to check the blue correlation. Wait, why did I get an extra? First of all, delete this. Um, so here the boundary is equal to three, four. Yeah, I guess I have seven matching in total. Why did I think it was six? Okay, never mind. So I have these Pluco coordinates and I want to check that they satisfy. So the theorem tells me that they satisfy Pluco relations. Okay, so P13 times P24 is equal to AFC times J plus H EJ. On the other hand, P12 times P34 is equal to A, E, F, C, H, J. Okay, yeah, that is A, F, C times H, E, J. A, F, C times H, E, F. Okay, that's one of the terms. And P, 1, 4 times P, 2, 3 is equal to, what is P, 1, 4? A, J, C times F. A, yeah, that's the same as this term. So the uh, so did we have the Pluca relation satisfied? And well, I mean that that's that's actually the pretty easy part. The harder part is to show that whenever you give me any matrix with all minors non-negative, I can find a planar a play big graph. Which I guess yeah, let's say. If you give me a matrix of the form one one zero 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 zero, then I'm supposed to give you a play the graph that corresponds to that. Uh, B one, B two, B three, B four. So okay, here here is the graph. Yeah, I can just kind of I can put two. These are called lollipops, and then maybe. Something like this. Right, and the only matching is gonna, the only almost perfect matching is gonna look like this. So that's gonna give me this matrix. Yeah, it's a cool game. You can. Wh how, what about the Vandermond matrix? And actually, I have no idea. Yeah, if if you. I know there exists such a graph, but I don't really have any particular graph in mind. All right. Now, uh, if you want, because so this class is not about total positivity, so there is kind of two nice sources. The first one is, by the way, this whole theory is due to Posnikov. Basically, he just wrote a paper in 2006. It's still an unpublished preprint, uh, which has drawn a lot of attention. And there's also this book by Thomas Lamb, which is much more recent, and it's kind of more modern treatment, I would say. So th th this is where you can find the, this theorem, or we, I I the, the statement of the theorem in this actual form, with the dimer model on a planar bipartite graph. So feel free to read these sources. They are very fascinating to read. Uh, but but I'm kind of going to try to focus more on the cluster algebra side. But still, let me try to let me now talk about. So first of all, I I have given you a parameterization of well the totally the negative Grossmannian. Let's say it's not quite a param parameterization because many graphs can give you the same point in the Grossmannian. But then we're actually going to yeah we're going to discuss this next. So for now, let me denote by let me uh, let me for a for G a play big planar bar bar bi prioritized graph. Uh, let me denote by pi sub G bigger than zero is just by definition the set of all boundary measurements where weight. So I, I just consider all possible 
positive real weights. And I, uh, okay, so that, that thing is a subset of the total in the negative gross margin, right? Yeah, all, all these minors, all these blue recurrence are automatically non negative. And those that are positive are precisely those for which there is an almost perfect matching with a given boundary. Yeah, so, so you have this. Uh, this is, by the way, called a positroid, positroid cell. The reason is that uh, positroid is a, like a positively oriented matroid. And if you know about matroids, then this information of which blue coordinates are positive and which are zero, it uh, encodes a matroid. So this is somehow a special kind of a matroid. All right, so, um, so I have this positroid cell for every plate graph. And what the first nice property of these positroid cells is that well, I guess that's a, like a proposition for any two plate graphs, G comma G prime. Uh, for any two plate graphs, we have either either these positroid cells are exactly the same, G prime. So the positroid cells either coincide or are disjoint. So, uh, so somehow, each, if you consider all possible playback graphs, they give you different pieces inside of this Grossmannian, and then these pieces are nice. So they're like each, any two of them, they never kind of overlap partially. They are always either disjoint or exactly the same. And the kind of so okay. So if I give you two graphs, let's say I draw two graphs, how do you quickly tell whether uh, they give whether this possibility occurs or whether this possibility occurs. And the answer is going to be well, it's uh, it's going to take a little while, but the main way, the main object which answered this question is called is using strands. So in our definition, a strand, a strand. Also called a, also known as a zig zag path in a play big graph G is a path which uh, turns, well, it makes a sharp right turn, turns sharply right at each black vertex and can you even say sharply right okay it turns sharply left at each white vertex white vertex. Here by, wh what is a sharp turn? A sharp turn means that whenever you have a black vertex with a bunch of edges and then your path goes along an edge and then it kind of like on a roundabout you just take the sharp right turn. And similarly if you have a white vertex and then all your, whenever you encounter a white vertex, you always make a sharp left turn. And then the strand permutation of your, of your graph is strand permutation, which is denoted pi sub g, is just a permutation inside the symmetric group Sn. Yeah, so it is defined by the condition that the strand that terminates terminating at well the, st the strand that uh, 
sorry. This round starts on at bi, terminates at bj, then the permutation pg of i is just equal to j. So that's just the definition. It's easy to see that whenever a strand starts on a boundary, it has to terminate at the boundary as well. Because this, uh, once you know, like once you have an edge and you know the strand that traverses this edge in this direction, then you can reconstruct all, all of these kind of, you can reconstruct uh, the whole strand from just one, a one directed edge. So in particular, it can't really, you can't have a strand that kind of loops, starts at the boundary, but then it loops around and becomes itself because you can always reverse this procedure. Anyways, let me try to show you an example before I, I'm, I think I'm already out of time, but since it's a pre-recorded lecture, I can allow myself to be a little bit uh, loose with time. So um, let me just try to draw the strands. First of all, I, I label, uh, I label the boundary vertices, and then my strands. So I start with, uh, I start let's say B1, and then I have to turn left at every white vertex, and then I have to turn right at every black vertex. So I have a strand that goes from B1 to B3. So pi sub g is going to be a permutation which sends 1 to 3. And similarly, if I start with 3, I have to turn left and right and left. Oops, uh, let me also make it red. Turn left and right and left. So the permutation that starts at 3, the, the strand that starts at 3 terminates at 1. Okay, now if I start at two, uh, so, well, degree two vertices, they don't really matter, but then I have to turn right and then left and then right. So uh, two goes to four. And finally, let's say I have some other color. Four goes right and goes right, left, right. So four goes to two. So that's the strand permutation of your Flavy graph. And well, what, what I almost want to say is that is that uh, this possibility occurs whenever G and G prime have the same strand permutation, otherwise they are disjoint. It's not quite true, but that's almost tr that's true for what is called reduced graphs, which I'm going to discuss next time. So uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, homework is due on Wednesday. Please do do not forget. Uh, have a nice weekend. <laughs>